Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Regen Ag Chat 20. Um, it's the continuation of the making my farm resilient thing, which will, this is it now. We've done three of three. And the focus for this evening is tall grass grazing systems. But we'll come back to that in a second. So, Nick, what have you been doing in the last couple of months? Um, last chat. We I have, have chatted, obviously. but We have chatted. Chat. Um, I have been mainly, um, I've done lots of he uh, hedge planting of the last, well, before it got cold, we managed to probably get, I don't know, uh, a kilometre of hedges in. We've got more to do. Um, the cows, this cold weather is amazing for the cows. They were going to come in on the 2nd of December and they're still out. We're just rolling bales out for them. Um, and the other thing, well, I've done quite a few meetings and we'll talk about it, I'm sure. But uh, you and I both went to the Nicole Masters thing it, at Althorpe, Princess Diana's Indeed. house. And um, we were slightly blown away by that. Um, I think for anyone who was there, she she is just something else. Amazing communicator. Um, met a few other people. Josiah Meldrum stood out. Andy Cato was very tall. Um <laughs> And yeah, no, it was just and a really very good. He wasn't just tall; he was also yeah, he was very good. He was very good, incredibly tall. It made you look small. Um, um, but the the thing going back to the farmer meetings, what what I've realised is um, we're a little bit in this kind of bubble of regen stuff. But I've did I did a discussion group for some hill farmers, and when I when I said to them, "Does anyone use electric fences?" they looked at me like I was some kind of person from out of space. So while this is quite normal in our bubble, um, there's, there's still a lot of people that are not into this at all. But going from another thing I went to, there's lots of people who are thinking, flipping it, we need to do something different and we need to start thinking differently. And for them, I think it's, where do you start? Like, like we've kind of been doing it a while now, but where, where do you start? And that can be quite daunting. But anyway, that's why I've been doing this. But I'm looking forward to this tonight. Yeah, and I, um, I suppose I'm halfway through my holistic management training, so that's exciting. <laughs> so I should be able to answer some of those questions indeed. And as Nicole Mester says, I'm regenerating myself because I've been to an osteopath because I've really hurt my shoulder. So that's what I've also been doing. So I feel a lot better. So people um, who will know you from pa the past list will find it mildly entertaining that you're on a holistic course. <laughs> As a you, thank you, before you start winding me up. But I think it's, for me, it's about thinking slightly wider. And because mm. I've done a lot of, I'm more really interested in farming systems. It's it's a continuation of that sort of idea of thinking like of the interconnections. But I, yeah, it takes on a couple of more steps. So yeah, my plan over the win, over Christmas is to is to do my homework ready for the one in January. Um, right. And what we should need to remember is that we're carbon calling the conference is coming back next year. We're just in the process of having a chat to Jamie Alexando, I can never say his name, fish head man, if you're familiar with that one. We did a chat with him a while ago. Um, so hopefully he's gonna come across. So we're just gonna have a chat with him this week, aren't we, to plan that. Yeah, and just on that, so one of the far meetings I did was farmers, three farmers talking to farmers, and I found some fresh blood fresh regen blood so if anyone on the call um knows anyone who's quietly doing stuff and not really um no, no one's found them um let us know because um the chap we found from i don't know if he's on the call or not actually but the chap we found from he lives in hexham so um he's he not. was oh, he was amazing um, so if anyone's up that way, wants to go and see someone, let, get in touch because I can um, give you his details because he was really good. Mixed farm, arable, beef, sheep. Yeah, yeah. And hopefully getting him as a on a chat. Speaker. The, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And also yeah. A, a carbon calling. But yeah, so if anyone knows anyone for carbon calling or a chat, get in touch. Ideal. So we shall start this evening. Um, so we've got a couple, well, three people on this evening and just really talking through their experiences of tall grass grazing. Um, I've met Am Emily a couple of times and I've known Fergus and David for a while. They'll probably tell you how we first met in a in a slight uh, combative situation, a, a discussion group. But, and, but first up really is Emily. So I don't know whether Emily, you want to share your slides and just take us through 
a bit of background of what you're up to and particularly in relevance to, or reference sorry to your Nuffield that you're currently doing yeah yeah no worries um hi guys I'm gonna share my screen um I think uh there we are can everyone see that yeah perfect thank you uh, so I was lucky enough to be awarded a Nuffield scholarship uh 2022 and uh my subject uh what is is uh mob race flood improving soil biodiversity and farm incomes i'll just clarify the word flood um uh, those of you probably know all about it but uh basically it's a, a flock a cross between a, a flock and a herd so uh we are majority sheep um with uh 60 head of cattle um and and we've also got some goats which I will go uh, go on to explain further as the uh, as my presentation goes on. I'm very uh, generously supported by the Elizabeth Creek Charitable Trust, who sponsors me for my Nuffield. So I'm halfway through currently. Um, oh dear. Uh, yeah. So this is a few pictures from uh, our farm. Um, a nice soil pit there. Um, the goats behind electric fencing there because you need electric fencing for goats uh some of our sheep and lambs and our cattle uh in a herbal lay uh so my partner uh, this is the farm um as you'll notice that was uh, on the right hand side that's a set stocked uh, picture from uh three years ago so don't judge me for the set stocking um <laughs> the um so i met my partner 12 years ago um i was working for farmers weekly at the time and um i uh, sort of got involved helped him lambing and stuff like that and in fact we got engaged at the weekend just this weekend on saturday night which is really uh which is really exciting anyway um so his his it was a family farm um traditionally uh two farms came together one was a dairy farm one was cattle and sheep um, and uh, and there was a, a fair, you know, it was very mixed, arable, sheep, beef, dairy. Um, and then he, his father died when he was 15. So he carried that on, um, got pretty intensive at one point. I think it was 1,200 uh, ewes and uh, sort of a couple of hundred cattle, arable, a lot of fertilizer um, going on. And then he decided to specialise in sheep and we were quite an intensive sheep farm, uh, indoor mules, uh, pushing for averages, all indoor lambing. Um, and that's how it's been for the last 20 or so years. Um, and slowly, well, for the last 12 years, we've had Cheviots uh, with the mules as well and they had their own replacements and stuff like that. But um, the arable, obviously, as kits got more expensive, uh and uh, that sort of thing we did rent out the arable and then we took it in hand back uh five years ago and put it in sh uh, stewardship schemes we're on heavy clay um uh so lot of our grassland is permanent pasture um and uh we started calf rearing probably about six or seven years ago uh well i started i, I went to market and bought five calves and then and we had to do something with them so we decided to uh, go go a bit bigger into that um and yeah so that's the background to the farm um uh spring 2021 i read uh, for the love of soil in fact i listened to it while we were lambing and uh the early lambing bunch we had a joint ill problem so what i was doing was injecting everything at birth with a mill of antibiotic and then thinking oh i better put prebiotic back into them to get their gut bacteria working and i was kind of going around in circles trying to solve problems um like a sticking plaster really uh and reading nicole master's book i just realized that fundamentally something was wrong and the system had to change and uh and actually mark my partner it, it was really on board with it and um and we we got really excited about going down the regenerative regenerative i don't like to bang on about that but i i i think it's just looking at things from a different point of view starting from the ground up the soils everything like that we 
we um we went pretty hard on soil testing we got everything we need in our soils it's just locked up we've got a very high mag locked up soils you know heavy clay um and uh you know we've got everything we need we just need to unlock it um so that kind of started us we started to mob things up um all of our sheep and running everything together and it's been a well it's obviously it's only two years so um so that on our left that's uh <laughs> that's uh, the cow sheep and uh, goats um and this is an interesting uh video on the right and this was only three weeks ago so it's just to show you how much regrowth we've had this was i mean it hasn't had the rest that it should have done but um to the next um uh because we sorry uh we had um we we were quite in drought conditions like the rest of us um and uh so basically yeah so th this is a picture of, of um this year um and in the middle that will be later on that will be sort of august time uh in the middle there with the longer grass grazing um and We've we've got a six point four meter topper, which Mark's very proud of, uh, but it hasn't been it hasn't been on the tractor this year. Um, we've been, uh, you know, and our neighbours think, uh, well, how can you fatten sheep on that and everything like that? So it's it's a it, it, it's a whole change in mindset to to have that length of grass, and we we anticipated having more grass because we were about to, we were hoping to take on some more land next door but unfortunately that's in arbitration so we we did want more residue um that was our plan we we should have probably destocked a little bit more to have more more under us um but it's it's difficult you know only two years in you you kind of you, you're still finding your feet so we but we were very pleased this year to have the residue we have done um and it stood us in good stead obviously on the right there's um it's a herbal lay um so we were we kind of reduced our flock partly because we've lost some land um because um mark's got twin boys and we've set them up with 120 acres with our own uh, that we envisaged them being excited about regen as well but unfortunately they weren't excited about regen so we decided that we'd keep our farm uh in hand and do that and then they could go and do what they wanted uh because uh, they're you know they're 25 so they need to get have have something you know they need to grow as well so um so that's what we've done on our farm so we've reduced the size of the flock to 450 about half of just over half will be um north country mules because we were north country mules and Yes, they're not the most low input um, of sheep, but they seem, well, that Mark loves them and um, you can't change everything uh, at once. So uh, we, we keep our own homebred Cheviot Cross North Country mules. So our flocks made half and half. Um, in 2021, uh, oh no, 2022, this year was the first time we did serious outdoor lambing with um so we were a bit later middle of march um we would typically be uh middle middle feb end of feb um so we have gone a month later um and uh yeah basically on the left you've got you've got our indoor system and on the right um you've got our uh, outdoor system this year so um uh we we have kept, we will probably keep our, we scan obviously, and we have our trebles and singles. We we like to, to mix it up. So it's, um, that's still a challenge um, because obviously our mules do bring that higher lambing percentage. So I think this year we did actually have them in um, so we could muddle them up um, as they were lambing, but it, it, 
as it always works, the signals hold on and the trebles land quicker and then you can't you can't do it. So um, I think we'll land mostly outside again. Well, the trebles and singles. Um, what we've learned uh, in the last 18 months is infrastructure is pretty key and having the kit. Um, so that's quite interesting that Nick, Nick was saying about people not really knowing about elect, elect, the electric fencing options that are out there. There's such a broad range of electric fencing options and infrastructure that make things so much easier. And it's, it makes, makes the job easier and you're more likely to do it. So um, cattle, uh, I guess if we weren't in such, we're in a TB six month leave testing area. If we weren't in such a prolific, we're actually, we only just went back down with TB on Friday with one reactor. Um, I would be tempted to go more into cattle, but the, the you know, the TB thing is, is a big issue for us. So, um, and so we'll always have sheep, but sheep are a pain in the ass because you can't put them, uh, put them behind one strand of, well, at least our sheep, you can't put them. Um, uh, I know um, a lot of people can, but I, I, was, I was tend to like jumping a lot. So, um, yeah, single strand, it's autumn uh, with cattle and they really respect it. Um, sheep, not so easy. So uh, as you'll see in the middle, uh, this is quite, um, this is from Powered Pasture, Alex Brewster. Um, and uh, I contacted him early in the spring last year and we planned, uh, planned our farm so we split our larger we're, we're lucky we've got fairly square uh, paddocks I should have put a map in but um, we planned it out into three hectare blocks so that we could uh, rotate uh, the flood round um, easily with uh, semi-permanent electric fencing with tarry gates in the middle so it's literally just open the gate and they come through um, and then the single strand electric that we use the reels like everyone uses that's more for the herbal lays and for subdividing those um, smaller paddocks. Um, but again, the Kiwi Tech trough, that's revolutionary. Uh, and I, I don't know whether they're in stock again, but I, I was quite distraught when they were out of stock. But um, yeah, so there we are. Um, uh, herbal lays, I know we're talking about tall grass grazing, but that it does um, play quite a big part in our system, I think. Um, this herbal lays is actually uh, funded by Seven Trent uh, Water. We've just gone back into our countryside stewardship, and so we, we've um, replaced some of our uh, environmental crops, so our uh, bird mix and stuff like that, with herbal lays. Because with tall grass grazing, I think there is the fattening lambs isn't particularly. It's not. It's not as easy. Um, like, 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 I think we're going to go on to say later. It's not um, you want you want something more powerful to fatten your lambs, basically. And we finish all our lambs, so um, so the herbal days is really our tool for doing that. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. I, I don't know if anyone else thinks that, but basically, this year our herbal days has romped away, um, and the you know the lucerne and and the sandpoint. Interestingly, we can actually, the sand point has come up, which is amazing because we're on really heavy clay, like I said. So um, I've been really pleased with the lucerne and the sand point. Um, uh, strip graze the, our young cattle on daily moves. Um, they trap, obviously, because of TB, uh, we had a lot, lot under them, but I think that actually really benefited because they, they did a lot of trampling there and it really built organic matter. Um, and uh, by the time they got to the end of the field, the, the first bit was really coming up and it was at a height that the lambs were, were better on. So I think that worked really well this year. So I hope, I hope that's gonna do that this year. Uh, these are my goats. Uh, I've got more goats now. Um, yeah, goats don't like uh, British winters, basically. Uh, I think that's an understatement. Um, <laughs> They, they really like, like, they've got shelter at the moment, but they do melt in the, in the, in the winter and the rain. There's a reason why they're from South Africa. So, um, 
it's a learning curve. Uh, they they are due to kid on in January. I'll bring them. I'll probably bring them in just before Christmas. Um, they're yeah, but they do interestingly. They do have different phrasing uh, characteristics. Um, they don't really like clover, um, which is great because obviously then the the lambs are left with the, the clover. Um, and they, they tend to nibble the seed heads and obviously all the hedges and stuff like that. And they are a, a bugger to contain. Again, the infrastructure, um, these solar panels um, are, the solar panel uh, energizers are brilliant. We're very lucky because we're rig fenced, but um, and I know that it, it can be a concern for, for, for theft, uh, having one out behind the band, but, but we're, yeah. I'm really impressed with them, and they're on the the uh, grants, the infrastructure, the farming technology grant as well. So you do get a bit of funding for them, uh, which is good. Um, as I said about my uh, Nuffield, um, one of the key thing was improving biodiversity on our farm, but also having the biodiversity and the animal health. It goes hand in hand. We've only we only wormed our lambs once uh, this year. Apart from the back end when we started fattening um again we uh, this year we have actually fattened on cake which which paid it it worked out in terms of the way we did it but you can't throw the baby out with the dishwasher of the bath water just to <laughs> dishwasher but you know you you have to you have to do the right thing for your business at the time and i think that's quite crucial this you can't be so dogmatic that you're not going to adapt things um to the thing sorry if i'm waffling on i don't know where we are in time i forgot to set my thing um uh so my nutfield uh this year i was really lucky to go to zimbabwe uh and meet one of my heroes alan savory um He's quite a scary character. Uh, at dinner, he, he asked what my my explanation of uh, uh, holistic management was, and and then proceeded to tell me I was completely wrong. Uh, despite having done the uh, holistic management course that um, that Liz is currently doing now, so uh, I don't, yeah, I'd be interested to see what you come up with at the end of your course, Liz. That's for sure. Um, but uh, it was really interesting visiting the the African Centre for Holistic Management. Um, and um, the, the picture on the right is actually, this is their, at the end of their dry season. So you can see this is a, in, a, in an area that's been rested and there's quite a lot of greenery and that watercourse behind um, uh, the chap that's talking there, um, that's actually returned since um, that me method of management has been instigated there. So there was some clear benefits um, in, in Zimbabwe to this holistic management. And we could see it in terms of the stock. Um, I don't think it was quite where they, I, 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 I think it's very difficult because it, we, there's such different systems, like comparing our sister, our um, systems with the brittle system, it's very difficult to compare. Um, but I learnt, we learned a lot um, and he's an inspirational guy that's done a lot of good uh, across the world so um, it was a real pleasure to meet him. Uh, my travels firstly took, took me to Kansas to the no-till conference uh, so we um, I was covering that for a couple of magazines but um, I also learned a lot about infiltration, um, organic matter, um, cover crops um, and also uh, livestock, um, integrating livestock back into arable, um, which uh, which arable farmers in the UK are just rediscovering um, livestock. So that's quite fun. Um, in Zim, also we we visited a couple of dairy operations. Um, this is a, a bush dairy um, that's run in a conjunction with uh, a more intensive dairy. So they're trying to improve the veld, uh, which is basically grassland, using um, holistic management techniques to move move their dairy herd and then milk them outside. Um, and that was having clear benefits to improvement in grass um, varieties and uh, makeup of the the actual pasture land. And that was, you know, they they were on very little feed, but they and their their yields were obviously comparable. But they, uh, you know, it's a different kind of um, 
like here it's a different a different concept then i went on to zambia where there's quite a few guys doing uh holistic grazing um on the top left that's actually maize stovers and those those cattle are moved eight to nine times a day um which is pretty incredible uh, so they're using the animal impact um to to get the disturbance of the soil they're moving them up, moving them on um and as you can see you know the, these cattle are doing all right um they this is their dry time as well so um they only just got uh, rain just the week after um, we left so um it's really interesting what's happening out there Portugal again. Um, the, these uh, these guys were doing holistic grazing. Um, it's so different though because it's obviously also uh, brittle and their environments and things like that. So we we have a much more forgiving environment than these guys. Um, uh, so potentially, I'm hoping our our stocking densities will be able to increase going forward. Um, in fact, probably the best place for for fitting um, for learning about holistic grazing is Scotland and on the right up there is uh, Alex Brewster's and he's actually bringing a uh, hill land back into production using strip grazing um, and improving pastures considerably uh, decreasing bracken coverage um, increasing species uh, palatable, palatable species um, so that's really encouraging um, and you can see the dung beetles on the bottom left and that's where I am so there we are I'll stop sharing now. Sorry. Thanks, Emily. Just a couple of uh, questions that's come up, which is you mentioned about your partner's sons in terms of they're not interested. Someone's asked why the $64,000 question. <laughs> um, I, 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 when I say not interested, they weren't as enthused and excited. And I think um, there's still quite a mentality of pushing pushing for production, pushing for shapey lands in market. Um, it's not all about the, it's not all about the cost of production. It's actually about the price of the animal at the end of it. There, there's, there's kind of a, that pressure of numbers, scale, you know, it, it almost feels sometimes that if you go back in numbers, you de-stock, you're actually, you're, you're taking a step back. And actually, and actually what we found is that we're we're improving everything we're, we're we're improving the animal health it's a pleasure to be around the animals um they're not needing as many medicines they're not needing as many uh inputs but uh you know still there's that mentality you've got to be big you've got to be you've got to have the biggest pen of land you've got to have this you've got to have that and i think um that might be a young man's game uh you know it, it, it's numbers isn't it it's it, it, you sometimes you have to qualify whether you're a farmer with how many sheep or how many cattle you have and how big you are and it's it's a funny mentality i i feel anyway and my question to you is why goats <laughs> because 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 regenerative people have goats and it's such a like it's such a bad idea <laughs> and mark, mark reminds me all the time that it's a bad idea but i do i do love them quite a lot but um they do, at least when they go to market they do they do make quite a lot of money but it it doesn't it doesn't offset and now i've got to farm my way out of them i can't just unfortunately i've got to i've got to clear my yeah so i don't think goats fit our system particularly well that's all i'm saying um so, so were they going to be goats for for meat goats. yeah well i kind of i went after Nicole Masters, I, I did all that, but all Gabe Brown, Joel Sides. I thought, right, yeah, we're going to stack all our enterprises. I've got chickens too. Um, so I was like, right, we're going to have every single enterprise. We're going to do a farm shop. And then you think, yeah, there's only one of me. And there's only, but you know, there's only two of us on the farm. And, and also we like, you know, we like to live. So it's, um, it's finding, finding your holistic context uh, and um, goats aren't, Aren't proving <laughs> on that currently. No. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. We'll come. We'll come back for some general questions after we've he heard from David and Fergus. So, David Fergus, can for, let's go for David first. Can you just give us a bit of background on your farm business? What do you current? What the standard numbers area? What's your per? What do you think your business vision is? Mm -hmm. 
see how far I can push the ground. See how far I can improve it. There's and how long have you been on that bit of land? That bit, I moved. I moved down here in '96, and uh, my brain was in a completely different place. I was just like Henry said, pushing for numbers, yield, use as much uh, artificial fertilizer as I could, as much maize. And uh, the system failed me basically. And uh, come the turn of the century, I was losing money, I was buying more quota, so I'd get the same, I'd increase my milk sales, but my costs were going up. And uh, I just decided I had to get out. So I got out of uh, 2002, I saw the herd, I thought, shit, what do I do now? Uh, I know, I'll do it all again in New Zealand with a friend. <laughs> So I went out there for a year, and that's where I really came across rotational grazing. And um, but what was happening out there at the time was very much similar to what I've been doing here, just pushing for yield, pushing pushing the grass, but heavily fertilised. And I thought, mm. and um, doing twice as much work, and I thought, well, this isn't really sustainable. So I came back home, <laughs> and. Uh, I had a break for a couple of years, and then Fergus here and his mates dragged me to the market to start it. Go and buy some cows and calves, and need to buy some cows and calves. And I thought, well, all right, I'm going to buy some cows and calves because I can afford, but I'm not going to lose money. So I was in the stock at the time, and I bought the cows as I could afford them, and I realised that from my experience in New Zealand. If you rested the grass, the grass kept on growing longer and it kept growing stronger. So I just started on a move of just giving them what they needed every day. And I started off with four cows on 120 acres, which was easy peasy really. So I looked through loads of grass. And uh, I just basically went on like that. And then we discovered, what was it, 2000, 2010, 11? I read a book by Graham Harvey. And what, what was the name Carbon, of the book? Carbon Fields. The Carbon Fields. And it just took me right back. It took me right back to what my great uncle used to say about red clover in the 30s. And I thought, well, I mean, there's maybe something in this. And then we started learning about mycorrhizal fungi. And then we attended one of your meetings in Fittenden where you were desperately trying to get farmers to move the cattle. And I think there was a bit of a fly in your ointment, really. And yeah, and then I, I just went on. Can you bring the uh, map of the farm up, please? Yeah. Should be there. Can you see the whole screen? That's it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Uh, in the middle of the picture, you can see a, a block of land, and you can see it's all different shades. So back in 2010, 2011, I heard somewhere someone had been on a farm walk, and they they put corridors in their fields. And I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Why don't I do that? And then he, well, I realised it cut down the amount of time you needed to set up an electric fence to move your cattle. So you just moved up the corridors, gave them what they needed every day. And if the grass wasn't as good, you could give them more. Or if it was really good, you could give them less. So you could vary the paddock sizes. And at that time, I was working off farm as electrician. So I didn't have a lot of time. So I, I gradually set about doing that over the whole farm. And if you look close on the other, on the other fields, you can see that's what I've done. And that, that's when we realized so that big field in particular, you can see, I started, the bear patch I started, and the cows, if you zoom in on that point, that's where the cows are. By the time I finished grazing that big field, I could have started grazing it again. And I thought, well, never seen that before. And so that's what, what we went down this route. And then we started looking up people on the internet, Neil Dennis, the late Neil Dennis, who was managing a thousand animals on his own, moving them eight times a day. 
And then I read Tom Chapman's No Fear of the Court. And he'd been to see these characters out in North America. And, and that's how we got into it. And then all of a sudden, the whole world opened up on YouTube. Um, we met these people. I read about these people, like Gabe Brown, Alan Seavey, and I just couldn't be dragged away from YouTube, really. And we just kept on pushing the cows, moving them every day. And uh, then I, I saw things like battle actions that were automated. So yeah, the spring gears. Uh, can, can you bring that the photo up with the spring gear with the cattle in the ground? Yeah. In the foreground. That should have moved. Can you see it now? That's it, yeah. Yeah, so that's what it enabled me to do. It enabled me to set up three or four of these and go to work. And uh, I could come back and then do it all again at night. So I only need to see the cattle twice a day. And that's what I could do in so long. And we started to realise that by doing that, we were, in, we were improving the ground. So that's what I kept on doing, and we kept pretty, pretty I think I'm mad, but uh, the numbers just kept going up, you know. And at present, uh, I've got 120 acres, and I'll run up to 130 animals. And so, so that photograph this summer is me grazing at <coughs> easily a million pounds, a million pounds per hectare, a million pounds per acre. Hector, I think. Hector, yeah. You can see they packed in so tightly that the calves burst out. Um, um, but and, I, and I suppose the question, which is that's that's in that's after a long period of dry, isn't it? In terms of that, you haven't had is, any yeah. rain there for probably eight weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It hasn't rained there. I mean, that is. I don't do that all the time. But what I do that. I generally do it in July, where conven conventional farmers, what they do is the, the grass comes in May, June. And oh, brilliant, we've got all this grass, we've got to make loads of silage. And what I what I found, I make as little conservation silage here or whatever. And I, but I'll take some out of the equation and graze it a month later after when I would cut it. Does that make sense? Normally, yeah. the conventional thinking is you cut when the grass is a lovely mature, a lovely leafy stage, and that's when you graze. Sorry, that's when you graze it, and then you, then you leave it for the conservation. Whereas I'm doing the opposite. I'm cutting at a normal time, but I don't cut as much, and I leave so much, and I leave it till it's got really mature. And by doing that, we uh, the animal packing them in tight. The animals only have the chance to get the the preferred bite, and the rest is flattened out on the ground. Can can you show the next slide where it's so that's the recovery, isn't it? That's the photo that's come through. Sorry, that's that's um, the same think... field, but but you're after this one. And I'm after the last one, I think, yeah. No, no, not that one, no. It should be coming, it's just there's a bit of a delay, I think. Right. Is it on now? Well, while that one's on, that is this summer, taking about two months after the, those animals were grazing that, that ground. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for in June, July time. You can see the width of the corridors. You can't walk through them without touching either an electric fence or an animal or two animals. So that's what I'm doing. I'm laying that on the ground and that is protecting the summer, the soil in the summer, stopping it drying out. And you can see the, the picture to the side, that's the clover coming through after, after, after that event. And, and that is generally when everyone else is burnt up down in the south end. We, we get some horrendous droughts down here. 
you've got a budget on a hundred day drought every single year in the southeast, haven't you? Sometimes you get away with it. And I mean, this this summer we've had to really contend with building a stock two stockpiles, one for the summer, one for the uh, one for the mid later grazing, which is now. So anyway, um, where was that? And what we could have, and what we should have said right at the beginning is is the farm map photo is the wrong way sorry That's is right. um yeah. that is illustrating the green that your farm was compared That's to right. other That's areas it. around That's a Google Earth picture taken on the 5th of August this year and you can see there's a similar sized enterprise to the north west of the photograph now that's the sheep that's a sheep neighbor that that is a, a small sheep enterprise there that, that's the one. Now this guy sets stocks. He produces the, some of the best Limousin store cattle in Kent, but he's feeding 11 months of the year. Uh, yeah, um, and to the right of the picture, we've got a, a farm twice my size. They carry roughly half my animal units. And I run it and, and to the bottom, we've got a guy who's a sheep farmer in the time, you know, but <coughs> I have to say he's, since his father died, he's doing a much better job there, but he's still, this is August, there's, there's no real grass other than my place. And so, so David, can I just ask on your, on your farm outlined there, how, how many acres or hectares is, is that? 120 acres. Uh, and, and what do you what do you carry on that? I carry 50, 50 sucker cows. They their cows the put their and their previous year's cows. Okay. To my stores, which takes my numbers up to about one hundred and thirty. Give or take. I mean, I I have these stock now. I've sold some stores in the market, but I'm not spending any money on them really, other than the expenses. And there's no fertilizer or any no. Anything, fertilizer. no. Uh, no workers, and, and I've even cut minerals out. I don't buy minerals anymore. Don't you? No. And I don't seem to need to get problems. When I first started, my cows would calve, and I would be, I'd have a calcium bottle at hand, pull the calf out, and I'd go straight into the vein with some of the thinner cows with calcium because the ground obviously wasn't providing the minerals, even though I was putting them in. Because I, I think general per, perfect minerals can antagonize the animals. If, if you've not got the right animal, if you've not got the right mineral composition, I mean, I, I don't test, but, but what I'm finding is now the animals are so much healthier, they don't, they don't need minerals. Which, uh, they do, but they're getting them out of the soil. They're getting them out of the soil, yeah. yeah. Thanks, David. So, Fergus, would you like? I'll just stop share the sharing this, but in terms of just talking us through what you do, and just remember, you might need to come a bit closer to the mic. Yeah. So, very similar background to um, David. When I was dairying up the road at um, the same time, I gave up dairy intensive in 2000, uh, and you know when, when the DFC and all the rest of it kicked in, and then put mouth and so that I had enough of that. I was heavily borrowed. Um, I had to, <clears throat> I was very heavily borrowed, I had to sell land. Um, I went into a bit of a, a downward thing. David went to, I came to help David actually, and he, he gave up about a year after me. And then he went off to New Zealand, and I didn't do a great deal, but similarly was started buying a few more animals. But what, I, what really bothered me, I'm, 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 I'm getting older a bit now. I'm, I'm, I actually became a grandfather about two hours ago. But um, uh, um, I, was, I'm bothered, I was bothered about the fact that I grew 75 acres of maize. Um, 75 yes, acres of maize on a small farm um, continually and was actually proud of the fact that I could do that for 15 or 12 years in a row. And using, um, I've got very much involved with how to grow a crop of maize, you know, using all the chemicals and getting around all the, all the, all the resistant region, region what have you. So, and the soil was getting knackered. And my dream was when I decided to go down the region was, and I was very much involved with ICI when I was dairying. 
And the thing was, oh, four tonne of dry matter um, per acre, 10 tonne a hectare, you know, easy done, and you're, you're considered a good, efficient dairy farmer. But what I didn't really realize at the time that was it was all coming in a blue batch and costing me maybe eight bags of fertilizer per um, acre. So anyway, I, I went down the regen route, but just like David, start building up, having had four or five years of, you know, dairy in, um, intensity seven days a week does take its toll. Um, anyway, we got over that, started buying, and I wanted to sort the soil out. And I can remember, I've got, I was having, I had the cows out the field last week, and it was a field that I'd grown maize on probably for, I don't know, 10, 12 years. Then I had to put some grass in and then put some um, stubble turnips into, into some sort of solid clay, like a, it's very clay granular, like a vegan, and it didn't grow, it was in a drought situation. The same soil now, it's, it's got, I would say the organic matter, I never tested it, I just know from how I farm, but that organic matter has gone up, I don't know, four or five percent probably. And now um, it, it's a completely, it's like cottage cheese on the top, the molehills are there. We haven't used fertilizer, no chemicals for years and years and years. And that has been, I just want to leave the farm like that. So I've been doing things a bit differently today, but I've been concentrating and become obsessed on improving my soil by any means. So I've got a small suckler herd, I bought in dairy calves and reared them. Um, I, I did, I mean, I've only got about 60 eggs or 65 eggs, which includes a field I use for festivals, which is very unproductive. That's come back in now. And I, I bought a lot of, um, I even went into Ashford Market, bought, I don't know, about 25 animals and absolutely smothered the farm with cattle, bought in hay just for this purpose. And I'm now seeing the benefits and I'm now slowly going back to, I've stopped doing the dairy cows because they, I, I don't enjoy it. I'm now certified pasture for life and I've got a suckler herd and I'm just going to tinker around for my last 30 years with a small suckler herd. And the big question is, how, what's the optimum amount of cows on my acreage? I mean, I've been running over, like David, a cow an acre, but with a small, say 25 suckler cows, I've got the option of keeping the calves for one year, two years, or fattening them and selling them for fast for life. And I look, at a, I look at the bullet now and think to myself, well, you can spend, I mean, David's neighbor probably spends about a thousand pounds on a bullet he sells for 1,100. David will sell a bullet for 900 and spend virtually zero. And to me, they're the ones where the money's been made. And I think I want to sort of go down the David route. I spend no money and probably keep the cattle out. Because I'm, the big thing we have to juggle, isn't it, David, is the, we very tightly stop. We can't outwinter. And we try, I mean, I was prepared to keep them out till January and at four o'clock last night with a couple of, I don't know, a few feet of the snow. So I decided to bring them in. Grass to go out to, I've still got covers for probably another two weeks. And then, then we'll have a short, a short winter. But one of your questions I see, and this is really, really important, and I'm a mentor. I don't know whether people take me seriously or not. I'm a mentor for um, uh, a part of life. And you're asking, um, how, how, do you, how do you get started in this? And what I'm telling people is, and Liz, you were telling us this 10 years ago, the quickest way to reduce, to increase your profits is to shorten your winter. And that is your starting point. And, and you know, and you, even if it's only 10 days, and I was on a farm somewhere the other day, um, whether they were listening or not, explaining to them that if you just say, put your cows into that little bit of conservation, you know, we all, I mean, I used to do it, we all shut off this large area, and that is silage, hay, whatever, whatever happens. And I was saying, well, put your cows, in there, let's take five, ten acres and then turn them out a bit early. And you don't need that hay and stalls, or sorry, hay or silage of that area. And immediately, if those animals are out, they're saving you money. And then you do a, a little bit at the end. So I started, I mean, what, I can't remember the day, but I mean, we went from mid October to, I mean, Christmas is a very normal time for housing now. Some years, if it's, if it's um, frosting, we might go into into January. But it's looking like turnout, if I keep them in now, will be early because we've got plenty of 
good recovered grass now. So I'm very much of the opinion um, that shortening the winter, winter is a starting point. It's a difficult one, but it's not that hard because you only have to do it by, do the maths. I mean, was it a couple of quid a day or whatever? You know, 40, sorry, uh, 20 days times um, your, your two pounds is suddenly quite a lot of money. Multiply it over your herd. And but people really struggle with it. And I just think, I'm hoping that I've got, I'm mentoring four people. I'm hoping one of them, I've got some in Sussex who I think is going to do that. Um, and I think this, I honestly think that, and I said this to you before, I think, I think we can potentially produce that same four tons of dry matter per acre off the farm. And that will be infinitely more successful than what I was doing on dairy because it's regeneratively, it's, it's sustainable and it's going only one way, which is up. Because if you have a bad year in regen, you can bet your bottom dollar you have a bad, worst year in doing it the way I used to do it. And we had some horrendous droughts back in the 80s and there was nothing you could do about it. So my, just quickly before I go, building up and dealing with the, you're asking about the, uh, dealing with the drought, the time that, for me, the most important time of the year is like David said, no so much photographs. The time you'll be mowing the largest part of your farm, you're grazing it hard, you're trampling it, you're grazing it, and you're moving them on. But the key for that to work for, for on, on our intensive system here, intensive in terms of numbers, is you've got to have legumes in that. So we've got permanent pasture with a lot of clover. And that extra clover, that more clover than you'd expect, is key to the, to, to the utilization of the, the slightly stemmier grasses. And the more clover, the more they'll graze, and, but you've got to leave it on the ground. And um, but the thing is, folks, what we're doing encourages clover. By stocking densely, the clover plants thrive in the long rest periods. I've been at farmer meetings and people say, oh, I can't grow clover. Clover doesn't grow on my farm. And growing up on, on a dairy, on my family dairy farm, I never saw a clover plant till July. As soon as we started this system, he heavy impact, the clover gets a chance to express itself. Yeah, I mean, I went to a meeting once. There's two things they talk about. I think I mentioned the year of Britain. I read, I think it was Andre Boisson talks about the clover crash. And I've never, I can't find that place, but you sometimes get so much clover that it, it just disappears. Something I don't know what happens. I don't know whether it, it, it's almost like it's, you put nitrogen on it, and then it will just come back. It's there, and none of these things I worry about. I mean, we've got bare patches on the ground now, and I know that there's a seed bank there from those July, June, July impact moments. A, 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 I'm still seeing the same species of grass that I planted in that field when I, when I, when I gave up years and years and years ago. The Timothy's coming back. The perennials come back. It's not. It's not what everybody wants to be. We haven't got the diversity. I'm just letting it, I'm just letting what happens happen. And that's the way it's, it's, So you, it's, you haven't put any more additional seeds in since June, not from the dairy days? I own, not since the dairy days, but, um, but not since I, I got started. I, I did my last, um, I did one read, my last VC was 2013. Prior to that, it was back in two, uh, 2001. Neither have reseeded since you were on the farm. Okay. Re so it's it's is true regenerative yeah. in terms of seed bank, isn't it? And also encouraging what's there and coming. Okay. And it, I, one, one, one other thing, Liz, which is really interesting, you know, we don't hear it enough. I went up to Ground Swollen on that Saturday and listened to Alan Williams. And what he talks about with bricks measurements really interests me. Yeah. Both David and myself are doing bricks measurements, and I know a few other people are doing that. And there's an absolute straight line graph between animal performance and bricks levels. And bricks level, you would explain it better than me. It's basically the nutrient density of the plant. But he will talk about, um, you know, he's talking about on ground that he claims is regenerated. From nothing from growing cotton of 25 and i can only assume that's all the year round to be clear i think it's because he gets more sunshine out there 
but the link between animal performance and bricks. Now that is, as he says, and I, really, and I wouldn't doubt it, there's got to be something that we've really got to be looking at. And a very unpopular thing, and, and, and a, somebody, and I don't know if say who, has told me, and I don't know whether it's true or not, but the, um, what are those things called, herbal legs, don't get such high brick levels. I don't know, but the indicator of the, the reason for high bricks, according to Dr. Alan Williams, is very good quality of soil, i.e. deep rooted and, and drawing up nutrients from below. And that obviously doesn't happen in short term lay. So I don't know if there's any truth in that, but I'm fascinated by bricks. I really want to know how we can. You do see a bit, Gib Barry, and you do see it from a baseline of 3% bricks. Every 1% above that equals 100 grams of live weight gain per day. I don't know whether you've heard that. Nicole Mars yeah. also talked. I think, yeah, I think she did. Yeah, it's yeah, she's really into bricks. And it well after the obviously the guru of Nicole Masters, I have bought a bricks machine and I'm starting to use it. But at the chat at the moment, I whether it's the fields or whether I basically it's there's been no sun since whenever, is that I'm just not getting very high value. So I'm I am doing some measurements on them, but it, I'm still in that phase of well, what do I do with it? So and yeah, we need to do. I would. In, Doing. We just need to do more testing and understand, don't we? Observe but Liz, I'm just, that. I'm just thinking. Has anyone on the call um, got a bricks meter? Because we, with our herbal lays, I've noticed that you put cows in there, and they prefer the verges that obviously haven't been herbal laid. Is that, is that bricks? Is that because it's, it's something? I mean, the, the soil, isn't it? Uh, soil has not been knackered in the hedge in the hedge rows. Mm. I mean, herbal lays are. I mean, David and myself speak from a very intensive permanent part of the farm. We haven't got an herbal farm to to have to look after as well. And I understand we've got herbal lays, so I'm more interested in to know why, why you know. I mean, how well, more to know how you get these high bricks levels because at the end of the day, we're trying to get meat out of our forage and regardless of whether it's herbal lay or whatever. I mean you you tell stories about sometimes the forbs have got higher bricks levels than the the, the, the what other people consider to be grasses. Yeah. And then then so that all becomes quite interesting. Um there's just a question David for you which is how many hours per day do you spend moving the cattle setting out fences? Um in summer when I'm doing that high really high impact I might spend two hours. Obviously, some of the fields a bit more awkward. I, I've got one field by the river, which has, has an electric fence down the middle. I've got a fence off the river, which is a bit of a pain, and I've got a fence off the ditch. So, but two hours, um, including that is walking to the it's an awkward farm. So I don't have a quad. It's infrastructure, isn't it? The infrastructure. I mean, talk yeah. to Sam. Sam's the master of infrastructure. He's got all and set out. And, and, and he's, he reaps the benefits of that. He's got quite a lot of groups. So that's Sam he, Newington. Yeah, you've got your lane set up. I mean, you, I mean, there are people who, who do, do four days, four, 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 four cells up at a time and, and just go to go and, and, and move them through each day or yeah. whatever. And uh, Jean Emily's outlined her watering system. So what do you do for water, David, first? Then uh, yeah, but, um, if you go back to that big field, um, is that easy enough to do? Yeah. Basically, yeah, every other yeah. corridor, every other line. Yeah. Oh, no, not that one. That one. Basically, yeah, I've moved in a 25 mil pipe on every by the side of every other fence line. Yeah. Yeah, so see where the post is. It, the line's running perpendicular. Yeah, so that one, the first, the first line on the left, and then the third line. So there's two. That's right. No, miss a line. That's the one. So there's a, a water line up that fence line, and every 150 meters there's a hydrant. Whether it's, uh, um, I think there's a pipe and fitting which, which I don't really like, but I, just a tap sticking out. 
And uh, basically, that's what I've got on, on the rest of the farm. So you're never more than 150 metres away from a uh, hydrant. And you use a drag trough. And I use a drag trough, yeah. yeah. And Fergus, how about you? I've got a smaller farm. I've got various points, and I'm a, I am a, a, a notorious project, so I tend to drag a lot of pipe around. And and um, but similarly, I just I've got points where I can get water pipe to the whole farm. But I've got um, I've got stopcocks in every field, um, and I, I, I get by. I do I, I, I do little things. And just going back to sorry, the Kiwi Tech have got I made a note of this. They've got drag pots and stock. You're asking, Emily was asking. Well, they did have. I had an email whether they still got them. But it's worth keeping James James Daniel I mean, because they're brilliant. They are absolutely brilliant. Um, and even during the drought, I mean, I was in Scotland with Emily on July, and um, my kids. Um, they, 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 it was fine. We kept them. Um, the, the, at that point, they had 70 in the bowl, 60, and you kept them going. Um, they, 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 don't, they tend not to drink uh, at the same time. You, you know, if you get the trough into the mob, yeah. yeah, I mean, you never see, you hardly ever see them drink. I mean, they all drink at different times, and they develop different patterns as well. Um, they don't another, see one another going for the water. Whereas, what you know, set stockings or a large cell, they may not go to the Trough, even though they, they need a, or the, even though they need a drink until the lead cow goes, and then once the lead cow goes, they all follow us. Un, under this system, a cow is drunk before anyone else realizes they're uh, they're drinking water, so it's as and when they need it. They so, don't have to venture out of the mob to get the water, and it, it is crucial. That's the advantage of having this system. Just another quick thing we were talking about, try. Management. I'm lucky I've got probably more wooden than this down here, but it became apparent to me in this last year that I've probably got about 20 days of grazing in shaded areas. So, one thing I am planning for next year is to fence them off early on in the season. Because um, I ran out of those shaded areas, but I could have had, I could have had a, probably another 10 days this year. Can make a, this makes a massive difference, obviously. I mean, yeah, they're a bit slow in the spring, but my goodness, um, I was, you know, it, it, when we came out of those shaded areas, things got very tight for a while. Um, so these little things you learn as you go along, and it's very much, um, you know, and, and I'm still learning to this day. And but and you but you're utilising existing trees rather than planting additional ones. Well, in the shade. I've actually. Um, about to embark on a serious tree planting. I'm convinced. You haven't been to the farm yet, my farm. Have you? I've got trees in the, I've got some part of the trees in them. And I am, I used to think the trees were all, all unproductive underneath, but I'm anywhere in the area of a tree canopy and bits of trees we got, we, we, we always, I'm sure we get more grass. And, um, and so I'm planting a lot of trees coming up. It's my little thing to do. Um, for, as a legacy, really, uh, at this winter, you know, lots and lots of trees. Um, okay. I, I, think, just, I think, sorry. And, uh, no, another question just on from Peter in terms of how do you manage your bulls? Comes up quite a lot in these sort of systems. So well, do you pull your bull out or what do you do with your bull? I don't, I eat either more. That solves the bull. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've, I've got it, a, it enables me to keep one more. That's, you know, I couldn't do this system if I had more than one mob. The workload would be too high. And, and can, you don't get the, the animal impact with smaller mobs, you know, and, as big a mob as possible. So, David, do you, do you, how do you wean or do you not wean? I don't really wean, you know, just the cows eventually kick them off. And and just, just um, expand on that. So did that happen, did you, your, did you just, like flick a switch and that's what you did or was it a transition it was just sort of a transition really yeah one in the early days i was going to the market buying a cow so they'd be calving all over the bloody town there was i don't have a i do have a relatively compact calving pan now but when everything was spread out it just sort of happened you know 
and I noticed, well, if you stand back up, I might have to pull her out. You know. Okay. It's very low structure the way we do it, I'm afraid. I know it doesn't suit a lot of people. I don't use, I mean, I know you a lot of people like to say these um, courses and, and charts and things, but I mean, this year has been a classic one where I can't imagine a, a chart on the wall that would have made, been any, made any difference because pretty much since March, everything's gone. It's, I've made decisions almost on the day. Things have happened. I've had more. Tend to feed hay at different times of the year, so I've had more when it's dry. The cows go out whenever it is, January, February, March, and there's no grass to feed them. And if it's wet and there's no grass to bring them in, and if it's wet and there is grass, you keep moving them. But there's, you just look at the year we've had. We had 10, 12 inches or something in, in November. We had snow last night. I, I had a man. I thought I'd set it all up for Christmas, and I, I brought him in, and I'm thinking what to do. And the ball was a problem because he got in with the today actually I was sorting around the bloody ball was in for about half an hour was in the group I was very nervous for a while so balls are a problem definitely you've got to find a little corner of the farm with a mate and um but they are a problem um, thank you there's a question for Emily as well um there was a question earlier which is um I'm not sure you whether you answered it by typing but in terms of your lambing date so there's a couple of queries because you in terms of when you were talking through you're you're sticking to quite a conventional lambing date but trying to do something different so there was a question about that and the second question do you have them in all in one group yeah so um we we've actually got we have gotten roughly a month later than our conventional kind of February lambing um so that's uh and we've stuck to that this year primarily because we still want to be able to finish finish lambs at the like the, the back end of this like back end of the summer autumn or before we want to get rid of everything before we go into winter so um it's an it, it's a difficult we don't want to we don't want to go into selling stores that's basically what what we don't want and we don't really want over winter more stock so that's and and we last year we were lucky with the weather and it was okay but then we had a drought at the back end so i think we'll stick we might go later when the grass is growing but um at the moment i think middle of march middle end of march is is more what we were going to do um yeah that's that's what i believed and in terms of when because you talked about you flurred so when does that start from turnout with you using lambs or you give so, so basically we actually lamb all in one block um so all of our you well we'd, we'd scan so all of our twins are together um then we kind of drift drift them out of the scenario and then we mob mob up probably three or four weeks uh after they've lambed and then we'll and and this year we did that um and it didn't seem to have a detrimental effect by mobbing up quite early. I know some people do mob up later than that. Um, they keep separate groups uh, a bit more, but as soon as we, we, this year we seem to have had very even uh, growth from our lambs. A lot of like, they're, they're very evenly spaced despite maybe having four, five, six weeks between lambing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we drift lamb, if you like. So we have two two larger fields, and then um, if we've had a lot of a lot of uh, used lamb, so say sixty or seventy in a day or whatever, then we'll actually move the unland uh, use to a next door field, and keep those keep the lamb use, and then mark and ring them because we are actually ringing and marking again. Some people don't like don't want to be don't want to do that um but we're in a position we can and it worked all right so then we move them into another paddock and then we'll bring we we just shift things from one field to the next and that seemed to work the um then in terms of uh our cows i replied i think we we run a young we run two mobs so we bring our run our cows separate from our young stock because of the bull issue um uh and 
there, there are people that actually inject their cows, like inject their young stock um, to make them abort, but I'm not really a big fan of that because I don't, unless we have to do that, it, it, it's, it seems, um, it seems wrong to be honest. So, um, uh, so unless, unless it's by accident, um, and that always happens. We had a, a couple of um, young heifers uh, calved this year, but uh, luckily they were fine. But um, so yeah, the bull is an issue. It's either a bull pen or a bull paddock or something. Yeah, it's, I'd, and we're not, we don't have the expertise to be able to AI like David does. Um, so I, I, yeah, and we've got 100% with our bull. So um, yeah, so. Um, and then in terms of bringing everything together, um, that will, they, the, the cows and the sheep, the cows, calves and sheep generally uh, together. And then our young stock is tends to be um, somewhere else, m like a little way away from the bull, basically. Um, just keep them separate. And there's a uh, question in terms of your wintering system. So what do you do with the sheep? I think, well, there's a, they're linked in terms of, I think the question comes with sheep you tend to not have tall grass. So how do you get to build up your tall grass system? That's rest periods, basically. So, okay. yeah. Um, so um, in terms of uh, keeping an eye on how long, uh, yeah, lo the longer rest periods and the, the quicker moving, they just don't get on top of it so much. Um, the wind out wintering, so um, our cows are still out. Um, so that's interesting that David said, uh, you know, every, every week less that they're in is saved money. So, and that's, uh, you know, this is quite unusual for us to, because we're, again, we're, on, we're, we're quite a small farm um, and it's heavy clay. And if it's wet, then, you know, we're going to be mess making a mess and it's not going it, to, it, it's just a nightmare. But at the moment, this, this weather is actually a godsend for us um, and it, long may it continue, but I know that doesn't help. You know, we, ha we are having to feed some ha uh, hay to our sheep, but that, that was literally only this week. And um, I think we started feeding our cows last week. Um, we started feeding them hay. Um, so they've, been, they've, they've done really well. Um, they're, they're full, they're happy. I think we will end up housing just before Christmas because we can um and then that gives us the longer rest periods for the rest of the farm because like like you guys say that um we we're not able to rest rest through the winter because of the sheep i know that i was uh, at an nsa meeting a couple of weeks ago and they actually brought their sheep into a polytunnel for two months and then put them back out to lamb and that's that's an option but our our sheds are busy earning money in different ways right now so they, it, it, it pays to have different things in sheds than sheep, unfortunately. Um, so uh, it's just getting enough residue over from the year before and not nibbling it all down over the winter, leaving that bigger leaf on to get going in the, in the spring. So it's just keeping an eye on things. And, and I didn't put uh, the picture on, but I can probably, I don't know whether I can share the screen. Um, we were really, surprised at our clover regrowth. Um, so if I can just quickly share the screen to show you. Yeah, um, just on that, and Fergus, did when you went to see Gabe Brown, I didn't, I didn't go and see him when he was over here. One of the comments that I've had secondhand from those meetings is he tends to say, we've got too many legumes. Did he say that in that meeting or is that just? Who says that, sorry Liz? Gabe Brown. We've got too many legumes in our grass. Yeah. I wonder why. What, that, that, I, it could be that that's the second. I've heard it second hand, so I don't know. But I was just well, curious. Anyway, I mean, sorry, I'm, Emily. That's all right. Do you want Emily to finish before I answer? But. Oh yeah. No, just quickly. This is the first of November. Um. Um. We just we've been back. We've been to Zimbabwe and we come back because it, it was still very dry when we left. And this is the regrowth after I think uh, two, three weeks rest, um, and that's the clover on the first of November. So we were very, very happy with that. Um, yeah. so that um, I, I, I agree with you guys. I think the clover is essential uh, for our systems. I, I, yeah, I w like you, we wouldn't be able to. 
gotten anything if we didn't have that in our, in our this is permanent pasture this has just come naturally um and um i would like more diversity in our permanent pasture to be honest um but it's just how to get that in and maybe that's the residual seed bag like you said with rest periods um we've got more red clover cup like crimson clover coming through now which is quite exciting we haven't seen before because of the sheep nibbling it all down um so that is something we have seen in in less than two years anyway i'll, I'll stop and, and i suppose the question because part of today was about um sort of dealing with the dry so is it the i suppose it's difficult to is it the rota is it the very strict rotation or and or rest periods which are they are mute that you can't separate one from the other in this system but june you can have we didn't have tall grass did we we couldn't get to tall grass for summer this year but you still maintain those rest periods i rest periods um with i think with the i mean one thing you do is we didn't overgraze before the drought i mean never overgraze any stage um i don't know may, i mean you get away with it in may um, at any rate or whatever but once we, we're used now to not um to having this uh, sort of weather too. We've either got long grass, long, long grass that's just, you know, a, a hay crop or a silage crop, gone to seed, and that's really key with the clover in it, and then you trample that. Or if you get to the stage, it's, it's you can't really plan any of this, can you, David? Think no. Every, every, you try and rotate around the farm, that's what we call the reseeding moment on a bit of ground. If you've got a bit of ground that's suffered, like David showed you earlier, I would imagine next year David will probably remember that. They'll probably look a bit thin. They'll probably let it go to seed. And I'm guessing you'll put some hay on it and graze it. Is that right? Yeah. And that will become as and, and you remember these sort of things. So and at some point, and and, and it's a sort of things just happen. Yeah. Um, and and then but you will also get short grass at certain times, like at the beginning of the drought, but you don't overgraze that. But that's treated differently to long grass. There's no, you, there's no chart, there's no nothing that can tell you how to do this. You just got to do it and understand it. The information is there from far wiser people than me and David, people like Greg, Greg Judy. Um, I don't know about Gabe Brown, he's a very different sort of system. Um, Alan Williams. I mean, I'm, Alan, Alan Williams, what we took away from the groundswell meeting, he said, do not do the same thing. To the same piece of planet at the same time every year. Try and alter it, even if you're just altering the fence line where it is. You know, just try and do everything different every time. It's just nature, basically. Because you think about it, these bison moving across North America, they wouldn't have followed the same track. It depends how many wolves were in that gully or how dry over was. there, how dry it was. And that's the thing that we're learning diversity. And it comes by not following strict patterns. And I think the chat, back to Nick's point though, that Gina, this, that very, I was going to use the word organic, I don't mean like fluid decision-making, isn't it? That's the reality is it's yeah. it, um, like a constant sort of observing, changing things, seeing what's going on. A, then that a part of the challenge, which is Nick's question, which is that's really difficult to get people to give. That's doing. I mean, there's faith in that, isn't there? There's but trust. I think, there's confidence. Uh, there's all of that stuff that's really difficult. But I think this is where Fergus, with the mentoring side, yeah, that it's that someone to phone to say, "Do you think I should risk this? Maybe we need to." to develop a, a phone helpline, Liz, and well, get, not us to staff it. Get. Exactly, how, how we've gone down this journey. We talk nearly every day. And to be honest, we're going to be doing something completely opposite to what I'm doing. <laughs> but every day this happens, isn't it? You've yeah. housed it, yeah, I've, I've not. I know. Yeah. But it's interesting the mentoring because I go, I'm going to mention names, but I go to different people and I don't know where it's going to work and I know where it's not going to work. Exactly. And and the trouble is that I'm you know there are people out there who, who are looking for more diversity. They want flower, you know, what do you call wildflower meadows and what have you. And I mean, we've got a small. You just got to get your head around it. We've got you know one acre and one animal. It's a very different 
you know, we have got to look after every single, you know, every single acre, and get as much out of it, and, and you get to know your farm very, very well. You know, I'm looking at molehills this morning, I'm thinking, bloody hell, we've got, you know, it's freezing cold. We've got molehills and worms in them this morning. I'm thinking, well, never in a month of Sundays would I've seen that in, when the dairy cows are running around there, you know. So, and I think it comes back to just briefly I'm back to Nicole and I know Fergus you weren't at that but in terms of that she it was the biological barbecue idea wasn't it which is this yeah. support network which you've got to find your people yeah and you mean and, and they're the people you ring isn't it or send them whatsapp message or whatever to say what the hell's going on here and it, I suppose it's it's quite a there's a vulnerability within that but that's where it, the trust comes within people doesn't it I suppose, and people's ability to want to experiment and try different things. But because these, they've been doing it for so, you're so ahead of the curve, you two, who else apart from each other in this country did you talk to? No one. Well, YouTube. You, I mean, YouTube. <laughs> no, so that, no. book, that book was, I mean, and we're both very fortunate, and it needs to be made quite clear that, I'm, I mean, I make decisions, uh, I'm, 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 I'm quite lucky. I mean, the family are interested, but not overly. Um, so I don't, I can make, I haven't got to go back and discuss with business partners. Um, my children are on board completely, Karen has on board, she doesn't care about it. And, and so we haven't got, we can make quite, we do quite drastic things. And, um, and you have to be brave. You have to believe in it. Um, but we found, I mean, neither of us are um, good on tech, but we found the information. On you know on on online and it, it was a lot of research and we got the car and drove down to Bristol University and went up to Rowhead University. We went ground solved from day one. Um, so it, you can do it. You know we went and saw Joel Williams and that was an eye opener with um, Elenigam's um, 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 student and back in 2015. You just got to want to do it. You've got to want to do it and the information is out there. I mean, great, great Judy's putting YouTube on all the time and showing quite mad things that some people will. The thing is, maybe it's, I don't know, I think, it, I think it makes economic sense. I mean, I can't think of, David's very possible, I think. And I don't know but, how you can make more money off an acre of land. But do you not think you two need to do YouTube clips now? Because mm. I think part of the challenge is that we, and I suppose Carbon Calling is trying to, which is that sort of, UK based, do you mean we still bring in a, in a headliner to get people to come, but we're very, do you mean wanting to get you UK practitioners represented because at the moment all the YouTube clips are based in America, Canada, different places that aren't us. I think, Liz, we should buy them some proper microphones and make them into superstars. <laughs> Can you hear? Yeah, just a bit muffled, but you're fine. We just have to concentrate. Okay, we're going to make you into superstars. We can't. We haven't even done that to us. Well, maybe we have. Well, no, maybe I, I, we have. We, to come do it, I, we could do it. We could do. I mean, I've done. Um, I take loads and loads and loads of photographs. I've got loads of videos. I photograph every day. You know, but I mean, I, I'm not. I, I'm not. We, I've given a lot of my time to a lot of people for nothing, and I'm very. I, I don't mind doing it. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, we've mentored people down here and got people stuck. Sam, Penny Bourne, um, Fidelity. You know, they've only done it because of David and myself, and um, I think they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do a um, Tom Penn thing. I'm a little bit suspicious of um, YouTube. Once it started making mega bucks, then they've got to start making things up. Is what I think to get yeah. keep the interest up. That's quite. That's why you could be. You you just need to turn yourself into an influencer. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. We'll, we'll come back to you with a plan. Okay. Anyway, I hope we haven't confused you all. Um, yeah, and Emily's also put in the in the Q and A in terms of if anybody's the the mob. There's a mob grazing WhatsApp group as well, which is also an uh, interesting yeah. place for Should have mentioned people that. Are doing Should that. have mentioned that. That's right. Yeah. So that's very. very I mean, sorry to interrupt you, Liz. That that was on my list of people who've influenced us, and you know, there's some great people. I mean, I love. I went and visited Nikki Yorkshire up in up in um, Aberdeen. Wonderful. Yeah. We know, oh, Robert. 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 I, I looked after Robert's animals when when his brother got married. You know, and he he started the group. He started. He started. He started. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Last. Uh, 
uh, last couple of questions. Any does anybody know whether waders like curly or lapwing cope with these systems well? Well, I'm not sure I, you have yeah, many waders in Kent, but you never know. We get lapwings. I, I do you know what? I, 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 I don't know, but I've noticed since I started, I know a lot more about. Um, I thought someone might ask that. I'm recognizing and learning a lot more about birds, and I will put that on my list of things I don't know is the answer. But um, the wildlife situation, I mean, yeah, it's unbelievable, really. The, the, the creatures that join you in, when you move the animals, especially if you're doing a it's midnight and under uh, um, headlights, it's quite interesting doing it at night in the summer. I've got, I've got to move. I don't want to know why you're doing it at midnight. In the, anyway, um, and I suppose there's a question, Emily, of adding to you, which is that younger generation. I suppose it links back to the your, I'm picking on your partner's sons, but in terms of do you think there is a move and I suppose mob grazing group and all that? Do you think younger generation are interested or it's just something that you sort of progress into? Or you find are you getting visits from a range of people on your farm? A range of people actually. I think um I think as uh as uh, uh, one son is looking on at what we're doing, I think he does he does see the benefits of it. Um uh, especially with the the strip grazing of the herbal lay um like that's that's clear to see because the, it's just so much so you know so so much production in it um so i think it's some and some it's it's where you are in your i think in your it's it's all about it all goes back to your holistic context of what you're are you happy with um not being the market topper or not doing this not that you know it's 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 a bit of a it's a process in your life really where where have you become comfortable enough to embrace low input systems or higher profit like you know i i think it's a process i think yeah um, yeah but um and in uh response to do we do uh, sorry mark um i was just replying to you on text um yeah uh, in the in when sort of May June July they're pretty much all together everything's together the cows and the sheep and then depending on like what the stage of is in breeding like topping time or uh, bulling or calving then they separate but in in um, yeah in the in the heavy growing season like, we mob everything together and then we move them quicker and I think there's, there's an interesting sorry to um, drag on a bit but the there's there's something called Sabbath grazing. Has anyone heard of that? It's basically yeah. um, uh, so so for our system, we actually are like the sheep. It, it, obviously, the sheep like the, the shorter stuff. So we kind of maybe go down to beer beer can grazing like height. So before it lignifies, um, and so if you keep on moving them back to to create that level. Then some fields ahead of you in the rotation will go will get longer as you know, and so whether you you shut that up for deferred grazing, or you um, or you rest that for a whole year, that's the whole idea of a Sabbath grazing. One field each year will be rested for the whole year, um, and then you start again, and then so the, that's kind of hopefully where we will get to, and then you're so like David and, uh, and Fergus were saying, you're rotationally resting one field for a whole year in your system. And then you, it, like by managing the growing season better, like by getting around the, those fields quicker, you know, even if you have like seven, if you have seven parcels, for instance, and then you never get to the seventh one, that won't be grazed for the whole year. Or if you only get to the fifth one and have to go back to the first one, then maybe you can cut hay on, on the sixth paddock and so you've got your you've got your your hay stock on that sixth paddock you've got seven the seven paddock that you're resting for the whole year and then you're still going back to the first and then you you move everything round one so that's the idea with this sabbath grazing thing which i think is really interesting because it keeps keeps that the the pasture level right for the sheep to fatten and like it, i'm that's where i'm we're he heading to i think we just need more infrastructure to allow allow that but yeah 
Um, so that's quite interesting. It's on, it, 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 there's quite a lot on um, the internet about it. So, yeah. Perfect. I've just, I'm just conscious of time. So one laugh, David was about to make a point and then we've got to finish really. Yeah, on that note, we did something rather crazy last year. We were asked to uh, sort of uh, give advice on a, a guy who bought some land and it had been overgrazed. And we said, well, give it the summer off. And then and they said, well, what do I do with then? And we said, well, bring 200 cattle on and move them through. And then we thought, ah, so we've got the cattle, we'll bring them around. So in August, we, we took all our animals off our farm, moved them onto this unit for 90 days. We didn't tell them, we didn't tell them, I don't know if Christine's on the line now, we didn't tell them why we did it. We did it on the edge, we've got to improve your ground, which what we did. But we also gave our whole farm, the whole farm got an extra 90 days rest. And believe you me, that's paid dividends this year. This year, yeah, we, we call it the yeah. I mean, and then, and um, that wasn't a cop out or anything like that. It was just it's taken it up another level. Yeah. And just very interestingly, is it Ian Mitchell in his home? Um, Ian Mitchell is. Yeah. And what he says is, if you've got if you've got too much land, not enough stock, you don't spread them out over the land. You he, he divides the farm into two and concentrates on the most productive part, lets the other part rest. It's a similar sort of thing. Yeah. And then co concentrates on that. Don't concentrate on the, the weaker, poorer ground. It's counterintuitive. Hard to get your head around, but you're going to get more response from your best ground than your worst. And if you're trying to get productive, the poorer ground will then follow on behind. Everything will improve, but the better ground will improve quicker. It's impossible. You got to get yeah. It's it's, it's took me all, years to work that out. We've always found this. We've always why isn't that ground uh, getting better than this ground? And yet the best ground gets better quicker. And it it's always it's it's not what we were taught, is it? You reseed your worst ground. That's what you did. But it's not you. Keep your animals on the best ground, and that ground will produce far more than the worst ground will. And resting it and then mobbing it the next year. Complicated, isn't it? I, I might, my brain's not just taking it in anymore. It has to be said. Yeah, sorry. I yeah. might need to, no, it's fine. It's all good. We might need to get you back for a special session. That's all. When, when, um, Nick set up your phone line and anybody can give you a ring at, when you're moving your cattle at midnight <laughs> on a summer's <laughs> evening, you'll be I'm fine. i move them now. Okay. <laughs> right. No. Calm. I've got to finish. Thank you very much, Fergus, David, Emily. It's we've we've done a range of chat this evening. Um, but just I think the I suppose Nick, what's your main take home from this evening? Um, my main take home is two things that that Emily said she learned more in Scotland than in Portugal and Zimbabwe, and the other thing is that I want to um, invite David and Fergus here to um come and give me and Reno some um uh more importantly you two could go and see them be. it's a lot no, but I want to get them here to, to show us like where we're going wrong um no, but no we okay. were I was desperately keen to come to Carbon Corley but you're a long long way away but I'm all in it I will be doing it next year no it's too close to ground swell I will and I need we're moving it to September we're, we're spacing it out a bit yeah, no, that's good and I've got family in Scotland so um, I could, we, we, could, we could put that in. Yeah, but it's the weaning, the weaning side, and I, I would like to talk to them about the money side, and I just, yeah, I think, um, yeah, we, we're, we're going to milk these two layers. They're going to be marvellous. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. <laughs> two simpletons like us can talk. It's not complicated. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a series of, it's continually evolving, and it's experience and believing in. Andre Boisson, Read the book, and it's all in that. You know, he talks about illiterate farmers in Normandy. He also <laughs> talks about assembly line workers not giving them enough time off. The productivity goes down and compares that with grass pads. Yeah. It's, it's, um, on that note, people want a picture of your bookcase, Emily, by the way, if you want to put it on Instagram. Thanks. Um, right. The bit I've taken away is 
I quite like the idea of being joined by many creatures when you when you move the tent. And um, so yeah, and, and just that. But I think and that support, the importance of support network and reading stuff and having that and someone to bounce ideas off and how important that is. So yeah, it's built. It's find your people definitely. So, on that note, uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we've had a good range of questions. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I should have said congratulations to Fergus's news about being a now grandfather and also Emily's engagement. We've had a lot to <laughs> celebrate. <with this. laughs> We've completely ignored it. So I do apologise for that. Um, also, if anybody is a Rosa member, I forgot to tell you, um, if you want to tell me your number or email me your number, I can get you registered for points for this evening. I should have said that earlier. Um, but yes, thank you very much. We will be back in January. But again, thanks, David, Fergus and Emily. And we'll be, see you all soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.